Saturday. Yeah, yeah we, we, we have been here to watch, like, we've been here for four or five Sundays. Right. Um, yeah, I, uh, I just had a follow-up appointment. This is all getting recorded. <laughs>
Uh, please take note of a few announcements that are in your bulletins. The men's breakfast is this Thursday at 8 o'clock. That's at the Carlisle Diner on West High Street. Thursday evening is the Dining with Deacons uh, program. Uh, that is at the Cold Springs Inn Brewing Company in Mechanicsburg. There is a sign-up sheet in Fellowship Hall if you are planning to go or if you need a ride or if you can give a ride, please, uh, if you're participating, sign up today after worship uh, during fellowship time. And uh, next Saturday morning, uh, there will be a memorial service here in the sanctuary for uh, Jarl Ulkema. That's at 11, and you are invited uh, to come and to remember Jarl and to give thanks to God for his life. Next Sunday, uh, our own Bill Beck will be preaching. I will be here. Um, I just get uh, a Sunday off from preaching. So if you don't like my preaching, or if you really like Bill's, uh, come along next Sunday. Uh, or if you just like to worship God, which is an even better option, uh, please uh, be reminded of that next Sunday. Also, there is a save the date in the bulletin uh, for Sunday, September 8th. That is our return to regular schedule uh, day, and it is also our church picnic. And so there will be more information coming out of the bulletin and in the weekly update. So please uh, keep that on your calendars and be ready for Sunday, September 8th, for the church picnic. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Let us worship God.
Dear friends, if we say that we are without sin, we do deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and in faith, therefore, let us pray together. God of mercy and majesty, you are slow to anger and swift to forgive. In Jesus Christ, you have shown us the depth of your love, and yet we are reluctant to love others even a little. You have shown us compassion and forgiveness, and yet we walk away from one another without concern. You show us the way of service.
our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Bearing children for slavery. 
Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, you childless one, you who bear no children, burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs, for the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. But just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, friends, we are children not of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Make us to know your ways, O Lord, and teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation, and our hope is in you all day long. Amen. And his baptism, as Jesus emerges from the water and the heavens are torn open and the Holy Spirit descends, God's voice is heard by all those who are gathered that day. You are my son, the beloved with you, I am well pleased. God loves the son, God the Father loves the son, and God is well pleased with the son because the Son has become obedient to his calling. Jesus did not regard equality with God, though he was in the form of God, as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness. Jesus' continued obedience to his Father leads him eventually all the way cross, where his one final sacrifice for forgiveness of sins leads to the reconciliation of all creation. Because we have faith in Jesus, God sees us not as sinners, but through the lens of the cross, forgiven and loved. We are then like Jesus and his baptism beloved children of God. Now all of us here today either are or have been beloved children at one time of our earthly parents, and many of you have your own beloved children. And the chances are good that while your children are beloved, they have at times given you reason to shake your head, just as your parents shook their heads at you and their parents before them. It's a time-honored tradition. Parents can both love their children and be perplexed by them at the same time, just as my parents. When Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, we real recognize these dual feelings of love and perplexity. A younger son comes and asks his father for his share of the inheritance, early, an insult, a real slap in the face to the father. And then the young son takes his inheritance and he goes out, he leaves home, out to the far country, and he blows his money on all kinds of schemes and fast living. But all the while, the father has been deeply insulted and deeply hurt, all the while still loves his son, though he is perplexed, 
undoubtedly. Then when the sun finally hits rock bottom and he finds himself coveting some scraps of food that he is supposed to be giving to the herd of pigs that he's caring for, he finally comes to his senses and he decides that he will go home and take his chances with his father once again because he knows that his father is a just man, a caring, loving man who treats his servants and slaves well and even though he basically spit in the old man's face, the young son hopes that his father will at least allow him to live as a slave on his property. Because at least then he'll have something to eat and a place to sleep and clothes to wear. That would be better than feeding the pigs. So the young man turns around and he begins to journey home and while he is still a long, long way away, Jesus says, his father sees him. And his father comes running to him, overjoyed. The son is coming home again. And before the prodigal son can even try to explain his plan to work as a slave, his father calls the other slaves in his household, bring a robe, bring a ring for his finger, bring sandals for his feet, prepare the fatted calf, because we're going to have a party tonight. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Love and perplexity. Like the father of the prodigal son, God loves us, even if he is sometimes perplexed by us. And I suspect that Paul feels much the same way about the Galatians. It is clear that Paul loves the Galatians. We know that he has spent a lot of time with them. He shared the good news of Jesus with them. He helped establish the congregations in the region of Galatia. He built up leaders to serve the church. But we also know that Paul is perplexed by the Galatians, because some of them have fallen prey to a teaching that Paul doesn't like, a teaching that Paul says is against the gospel. They've fallen prey to a group of Jewish Christians who have arrived in Galatia with a message that is different from Paul's gospel of grace. They're teaching the Galatians and that Gentile believers must first become obedient to the law of Moses, and then, and only then, can they become Christians. And as we've heard all summer long, Paul has spent most of his letter explaining to his beloved Galatians why those teachers are wrong, and why they must not listen to them, and why salvation is the free gift of God's grace by faith for all who believe in Jesus. At his heart of hearts, Paul is a pastor. And so he teaches and preaches God's word in order to bring people closer to God so that their faith might be strengthened and they would know the full extent of God's <coughs> love for them. For Paul and for all of the early church, the only scripture they know is what we today call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. The letters that Paul is writing, Galatians, for instance, are not yet part of scripture. They're literally being written. They are the earliest documents that the Christian church has in the New Testament. None of the gospels have been written at this point when Paul is writing to the Galatians. And the stories of Jesus are circulating as scraps here and there, a story here, a story there. Some of them are being written down. Many of them are still just being told by word of mouth, like the story of the prodigal son. So Paul 
pulls a story, a thread of a story, the story of Abraham from the book of Genesis. And he uses it to get his point across to the Galatians. Specifically, it's a story about Abraham's two sons. One, Ishmael, born to a slave woman, Hagar. The other, Isaac, born to Abraham's wife, Sarah. And if you read this passage, or listened as I was reading it to you, and you were a little confused, or dismayed, or thought, what's that all about? Don't worry, you're not alone. Paul even tells us up front that we are reading scripture in a different way. Paul tells us right in the midst of this lesson that he is interpreting this story allegorically. Allegorically, where elements of the story represent something far beyond themselves. It's not just what does the text say, but how does this compare to something else? In this case, as Paul is interpreting the story of the two women, Hagar and Sarah, who each bear sons for Abraham, Paul says they represent two different covenants. One is a covenant of slavery, and one is a covenant of freedom. Hagar, the slave woman, if you remember from Genesis, was given to Abraham by his wife Sarah because she couldn't have children for her husband. And Sarah thought, well, at least if Abraham could have a son with Hagar, then at least he would have descendants that way. But God, as you may also recall, had other plans. And when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90, she gave birth to a son, Isaac, who was promised be the ancestor of God's people. Paul says that the Jewish Christians who want everybody, including the Gentile converts, to follow the law of Moses, they are like the children of Hagar, Paul says, slaves to the law. But all those who believe in Jesus as the Son of God and that he died to free us from our sin, they are like the children of Sarah, free. The children of Hagar, Paul says, try to save themselves by the work of their hands, by following the law, but the children of Sarah rejoice that their salvation comes by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ. So today, even today, we face the temptation to believe, like some of those Galatians did, that our salvation, or at least part of our salvation, is somehow up to us. There's a great temptation for us to think, if I just work hard enough, if I just do enough good deeds, if I just pray enough, if I try not to sin too much, good enough as a person, then I'll be okay. God, God will love me. God will forgive me. And that way of living, trying, trying not to sin too much, is exhausting. And it keeps us in bondage to our own many failures. Paul says, now my friends, you are children of the promise. Like Isaac. That promise is the promise of freedom, the freedom that we have in Jesus. And don't turn away from that promise, Paul says. Don't forsake it. This freedom, this freedom not to have to follow the strictures of the law. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery the yoke of the law. In other words, I think what Paul is trying to say to the Galatians, and 
by way of the Galatians also to us here today, is to remember that you, and you, and you, and you, we are all beloved children of God. Just as God claimed Jesus in our baptisms, God has also claimed us. Now the heavens perhaps weren't torn open, the dove didn't descend, God's voice didn't boom perhaps, but nonetheless, God claimed us in our baptism. And if God has claimed us as his own and set us free from the power of sin and death, then why on earth would we ever want to become enslaved to anything ever again? If the Son makes you free, Jesus says, you will be free. Dear brothers and sisters, our citizenship is not of this world. We are citizens first and foremost of the kingdom of God. Everything else is a distant second. As we gather today at the Lord's table, we receive a foretaste of that promised heavenly kingdom where all of God's children have a place at the table there is no more pain or suffering or injustice. Until that day comes, however, let us stand firm in our freedom and continue to be the hands and feet of Christ, loving and serving this world as the beloved children.
shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts and minds together as we go to God in prayer. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, O God, we come into your presence today, reminded of your great love, reminded again that you have claimed us in baptism, and as we prepare to go out into the world this week, O oh Lord, may you hold on to us and may we hold on to these great truths that we might bear your glad message of love and grace and mercy and peace to all people. Lord, as we gather this day, we are reminded again of your love reminded again of your call in our lives. We are reminded that we are free people as followers of Christ and that you call us not to take our freedom in Christ for granted, but to stand firm in that freedom and to not submit to a yoke of slavery once again. But, O oh Lord, you know our weaknesses, you know our hearts. And so give us strength, O oh God. Give us strength to continue to love and to serve in your name. As we gather this day and gather around your table, O oh Lord, remind us again that you feed us at this holy table to strengthen us and send us out to be your disciples. May we come to this table today, O oh God, with glad hearts, and may they be filled with your love and service. As we gather today in worship, O oh God, we are reminded that there is much to pray for in our lives and in our world. We pray again for peace, O oh God, that your peace would reign over all the earth. We pray for peace, especially in Ukraine. We pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray, O oh God, that in that place where generations of your people have lived, that there would be a change in some way that your people might learn to live in peace. We pray for our own peace, O oh God, for our hearts are often restless and not very peaceful, but we seek to find rest and peace in you. As we gather this morning, Lord, we pray for our own nation, for the division that, we, that faces us, for all the disagreement, Pray, O oh Lord, that we might be able to see that as a people we have much more in common than what separates us and divides us. We pray for our own community, O oh God, for our leaders in this place, for those who serve the common good in so many different ways. We pray, O oh Lord, for the vulnerable, the hungry, the weak, the homeless, those with anxiety. Lord, in, all, in your mercy, we pray that you hear us. We pray that you hear our prayers for our own congregation, this little part of your kingdom here, that you would bless us and strengthen our faith and encourage us to love like Jesus loves. For all of our prayers, O oh God, that we bring with us today, prayers that are on our minds and in our hearts, the prayers that we struggle even to put words to. You hear them, and we give thanks that you hear our prayers as a father hears a child. We pray, trusting in Jesus' name, as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
seated, please. This table, this feast from heaven is for all who believe and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, including children who have been baptized and have been instructed by their family. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is Christ to be our thanks and praise. Eternal and ever living God, it is right to bless you, to give thanks to you, and to worship you in every place where your glory abides. You made us in your image. And you called us to be your people. But we turned from you, and sin established its reign by way of death. Still, you loved us and sought us. In Christ, your grace defeated death and opened the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voice with choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place. Whoever sing, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. O sound in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O sound in the highest. Holy God, in your mercy you sent the one in whom your fullness dwells, your only begotten, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We glorify you for your great power and mercy at work in Christ by his suffering and death on the cross. Our sins are forgiven. In rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. We praise you that Christ, our life, now reigns with you in glory, praying for us until all things are made perfect in Christ. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remember these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ. We take this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate this holy sacrament. With praise and thanksgiving, we offer ourselves to be living sacrifices dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit now upon us and on these gifts of bread and wine, that in eating this bread and drinking this cup, we may know the presence of Christ and be made one with him and one with all who come to this table. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray that you will fulfill your eternal promise in us and in all the world. Keep us in communion with all the faithful from every time and place until we rejoice together in your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The night he was betrayed by one of his twelve disciples, Jesus sat at table with them, took bread, broke it, gave thanks, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the sins of many.
come, ate the feast of bread and wine provided us from God the Father through Jesus the Christ. Come down the center aisle, please. Exit by the side aisles. There will be gluten-free option over here on my right or left. Uh, Come to the table.
Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord of light, life, and color, having blessed us through your communion with your Son, shine in me through this day and days to come. As I turn my face toward you, may my eyes blink at your words, my heart beat at your beauty, and my life reflect your radiance. I pray in Jesus' name.